This morning, I want to draw your attention to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. My message today is, guess who's coming to dinner? Guess who's coming to dinner? When you come to chapters 14 and 15 in the Gospel of Luke, uh, they'll find unique stories that only Luke recorded, but in those two chapters, you get there's some just fascinating stories. There are some cherished passages, the Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan, there's the lost sheep, the prodigal son, there's the story of Jesus healing the ten lepers. And sometimes when we're reading that, we are so caught up in those wonderful stories that we cherish, we sometimes miss or don't pay as much attention to a parable about a great banquet that he mentions uh, in chapter 14. So the parable that we're going to look at today is uh, held at a banquet at a Pharisee's house. One of the rulers of the Pharisees was having a banquet and Jesus was invited. It says in verse 1 of Luke's Gospel, One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat at the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. You see, it was kind of a trap. Usually it was when the Pharisees invited Jesus. right? And so it was kind of a trap. And so Jesus heals this man of... Uh, edema or dropsy, he healed this man of this particular disease. And then he tells them two parables while he's there. The first parable we won't talk about today. It's found in the first few verses, just about a wedding feast and the etiquette. If you're going to invite somebody, this is who you should invite. And don't invite your friends who can invite you back. Invite people that can't afford to pay or invite you back. So it was just kind of an etiquette one. And uh, so in the middle of all of that explanation and things that he'd been saying that are recorded in chapter 13, there was a guy around that table. I don't know who he was, but all of a sudden he got so excited that he exploded in emotion in uh, verse 15. And he, before Jesus told this next parable, he exploded and he said, Blessed is the one who is able to eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. He just exploded. And perhaps there would have been some at the table that weren't paying attention too closely to what was said earlier. But what Jesus, or what he was referring to is what Jesus had mentioned just previous to that in chapter 13, verses 28 to 29. Look at what Jesus said. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you yourselves will be thrown out. People will come from the east and the west and the north and the south. And they will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. That's the feast he's talking about. And then he tells them about wedding or I mean, uh, etiquette and inviting people to banquets. And then this man is sitting there. And I guess he was so caught up in the idea of being a part of this wonderful kingdom feast that's going to happen one day exploded they say blessed is the one who's going to have a place at that banquet blessed are you today if you are invited to that banquet and you're going to be there it's going to be something else folks it's amazing and so that's kind of what is happening here see a banquet in the bible is a symbol of salvation it's a symbol it was an event but it was also a symbol in Revelation 19, verse 9, it said, says there, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. We're blessed if we're invited to that wedding supper. Salvation will culminate. You know, I am saved. I was saved when I was 18 years of age. And every day I am being saved. And one day I will be completely saved. <laughs> I was sanctified, made clean by the blood of Jesus. Every day that I walk closer to Him, I am being sanctified. And one day, I will be perfectly sanctified. And I will be put, placed before God without fault. Isn't that amazing? You and I are going to stand before God without fault. And we're going to say, but, but God, do you know me? And He can't see our sins because He looks through the blood of Jesus. So, blessed are those who are... It's this, this whole idea, anyways, of the feast... And I'm glad that uh, God loves to have feasts and throw parties. And uh, that's what we see throughout the Old Testament and we refer to many times in the New Testament. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
The feast of the Passover feast, the feast of Pentecost, the feast of tabernacles. God set out in the yearly calendar a feast. And he said, Jewish people, I want you to get together and I want you to eat and I want you to enjoy each other and I want you to enjoy me and I want you to have a good time. I want you to have lots of food. <laughs> and so that's what God did for the Jewish people. This idea of a banquet to culminate salvation is embedded in Old Testament theology. You see it in one of the favorite Psalms, Psalm 23, verses 5 and 6, where David said, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and I shall feast at the table spread for me. But one of the dearest verses or parts of Scripture in Old Testament is Isaiah 25. I love it. I think you'll love it as you hear it. You've already read it, I'm sure. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all people. Hallelujah. All people. A banquet of aged wine, the best of meat, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy that shroud that right now enfolds all people. The sheet that covers all the nations. He'll swallow up death forever. Hallelujah. <laughs> the sovereign Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. <laughs> he will remove his people's disgrace from the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. <laughs> Hallelujah. What a day. It's a feast. And we're all invited. If we know Christ, we're going to be a part of a great end time feast. He will prepare a feast of rich food, a great banquet for all people. Everybody's invited. Five times in the book of, or in Isaiah, in those few verses, the word all is there. Hallelujah. All people. All tears, all death, all reproach. The veil covering all the nations will be removed. People swallow food at the banquet. God's going to swallow up that veil right now, that shroud that covers people. The death, the tears, the reproach. Not taken away, destroyed. Taken away means it might come back again. But when he swallows it up, it's gone forever. No more death. No more veil, no more reproach, no more tears. Pure grace, too. It's all of grace. Because invited guests cannot bring anything that could pay for that meal that we're going to have. Isaiah makes that clear in chapter 55 when it says, Come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. You who have no money. Come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk. Without money and without cost. Why do you spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Hallelujah. Come, it's free. Salvation is free. We cannot come up with enough money to pay for one single drop of blood that Jesus shed for us. And one drop of blood is enough to cover the sins of all the world. We just cannot pay for it. But he says, come and have a seat at this banquet. Come and eat. It's free. Jesus paid it all. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus anticipates a great banquet at the end of time. As we know it, at the end of the age. And so we pick up the story. Verse 16. Jesus replied to this man who had this outburst. Blessed is the one who comes to the banquet. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come, everything's now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I bought, some, bought a field. I must see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys 
of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there's still room. There's still room. Hallelujah. <laughs> then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who have been invited and turned it down will taste at my banquet. The parable of the great banquet is also called the parable of seven speeches by some people. And so as we look at this this morning, let's consider seven scenes as if it were a movie or something like that. There are two invitations that are given out. There's an invitation that's given out originally, and the guest said, yep, we'll be there. Right Now there's a second invitation that says it's now ready. <laughs> Come, it's ready. When you received an invitation in the Eastern culture and you said, yes, I'm coming, you knew that someday you would get something like a text. The news would be, or an email or whatever. The message would get out, of course. They didn't have emails or text, but somehow the message would get out. It's now, come on, right now. And so that's what happened in this particular parable. Two invitations to the original guests and two invitations are given to outsiders, as we saw near the end of that parable. So in this first scene, it simply is a scene of a great banquet that's prepared. A great banquet means there's a great man and a great host. And this particular banquet, he invited his peers and his associates. And in the Middle East, you must provide food, you must provide meat. This is a meat lover's delight, going to a Jewish feast. Well, if you had a couple of guests, you know, two to four guests, you might have one or two chickens. If you had four or six guests, you might have a duck if it's bigger than big enough. If you had eight to 15, you might kill a goat. 15 to 30, if it's a good enough size, you might get a sheep. And if it's more than 30, well, you better kill the fatted calf. It's, that's the way it was for the Jewish people in their culture. The amount of food was determined by the host once he knew how many invited guests had accepted the invitation. So the invitation has gone out based on the number of people that said, I'll be there. That's what happened in this particular case. So the email, the texts went out and said, it's right now, come on. And the, the word come here is an imperative. It's like, it isn't like, would you like to? It's come now, right now, the invitation. And so this is a double invitation. Now is the time for you to come. It's like in the book of Esther and Haman, uh, Esther's prepared this, this feast and Haman is busy trying to collect himself. And all of a sudden somebody shows up into the room and takes him and says, come on, the queen's got the meal ready. You, you don't wait around for that. This is a cultural thing that we're looking at here. The hour of the banquet has arrived. And then a surprising turn of events takes place unanimously they begin to insult the host, and the invitation had been accepted, the animals had been butchered, the meat was cooked, the guests were summoned, and all at once they began to make excuses. And their excuses boil down to these three things. I did this, therefore I must do this. Excuse me, I can't make it. In each case, pardon me for saying this maybe, but they are bold-faced lies no truth to what they said. Let me explain. In the second scene, let's look at the real estate expert. He said, well, I did this, therefore I must do this. Please excuse me, I must. Dot, dot, dot. Why do I say it's a bold-faced lie? Well, we're dealing with the Middle East, and nobody, especially a Jew, <laughs> would ever buy a piece of land without first knowing every square foot of that land. How many wells are on that property? How many trees? How many stone walls, paths, anticipated rainfall? You have to know the human history of the field and be able to recite the prophets if you're buying something that has fields that, grows, that grow things. It's a long drawn out process and often it takes years. And so in a land like Israel where there's limited space, the host is supposed to believe him that he bought a field, but he didn't even look at it yet. Purchased, sight unseen. That's like uh, Brother Mike down here. And he says to his wife, I just, uh, or to the pastor, about 
something he says i just bought a house over the phone and i must go now and see what it looks like and what the neighborhood's like <laughs> pretty crazy right and his wife would say you better not do that well that's kind of what we see happening here so what's the point at looking at a field anyway you've already bought it so let's go to this banquet so really that was an excuse and uh he could have been, he should have been negotiating this for months. This wouldn't have been something that just happened. And, and suddenly he insists, I gotta settle things tonight or I gotta go see it, whatever. It's not the intent. The intent is an intentional insult to the person, the host. And that's what happened here. I must go and see a field. Going to see a field is more important than going to see the host and going to this banquet. Well, in the second scene, we have this farmer. He's a plowing expert, actually. He says, I did this, therefore I must do this. Excuse me, I'm going. You see, when you were buying oxen in those days, a team of oxen, and the same would be for today, I'm sure. But in those days, the team would be taken to market. They'd be brought outside the market, someplace where there was a small field, and the people would watch how they worked together. Did they work together? And uh, do they... Plow well, are they strong? All, all those things to show off their strength and their teamwork. In smaller villages, the owner might announce the sale and the people will come from all over to watch the oxen perform. That's what would happen normally in the Middle East. It's like uh, Paul Bedard saying, you know, I can't come to church today. I just bought five used cars and I bought them over the phone. I'm on my way to see what they look like and what old they are and if they'll run. <laughs> I mean, it's that crazy what's happening here. On hearing this, even the most devoted friends will worry about their, the sanity of their friend if they did that. The real estate expert said, I just bought, I must go. The plowing expert said, I just bought, I am going. Animals are more important, apparently, than this host of the party. And then we have the passionate bridegroom. And now we want to cut a little bit of slack for this guy when we think, well, come on now. But he said, I'm married. It's past tense. It's not the wedding, by the way. It's already happened. And so he's come up with an excuse that he's now married. And so he's kind of blaming his wife, I guess. <laughs> Yesterday would have come, but this afternoon I can't. I'm busy with my wife right now. My time with her is more important than my time with you, Master. Well, these excuses are really unacceptable ones. And when I think of people getting an invitation and having no excuses that would be good enough, I think of Queen Elizabeth when she, her, not her, but the uh, British government, when Canada was part of the Commonwealth in 1953, there was an invitation that was sent out to all the Commonwealth countries and would include our Prime Minister at the time. And it said these words, We greet you well, whereas on the 2nd of June, 1953, <clears throat> there's going to be a coronation, I'm paraphrasing. These are therefore to will and to command all excuses set apart. <laughs> Do you get that? All excuses set apart. That you make personal attendance upon us at the time above mentioned, there to do and to perform such services as shall be required of you. All excuses set apart, the British government said to anybody that's a part of the Commonwealth. So Prime Minister no, of Canada, no excuses. I don't care if it's your kid's birthday party. I don't care if you broke your arm, you still got to be there. There's no excuse unless you're on your deathbed. No excuses, you got to be there. And that's kind of the importance of this banquet that these people had been invited to. Same thing. The parable teaches that as they reject Jesus with these unacceptable excuses, they're actually rejecting the great banquet of salvation that's promised in Isaiah chapter 25 that we read about. So we come to this fifth scene in this particular story. And the master says, go to the streets and fill this house up. We're still places. These people are coming. We have to fill the house up. The host is pretty angry about this time, and he knows that he's been publicly insulted. So he says, go to the riffraff of, this is, of the village. Also, go to the poor, go to the lame, go to the blind, go to the ostracized. The ones that normally wouldn't have been invited to this prominent Pharisee's home. And he basically said, go to those 
Jewish outcasts and bring them in. And the original guests assumed, you know, this banquet's not going to go on without us at the banquet, right? But not this host. He doesn't get the food and the banquet is the big deal. And he's hoping everyone will come. The host's not indebted to these outcasts. They will never be able to return the favor. These people that he's now invited. So the offer is accepted. Of course, we're coming to the banquet. And then the next scene, it says the house still isn't full. The servant says, I went and there's still more room around this in, in, in the banquet hall. And so in the final scene of this story, he goes not to the outcasts, but the outsiders. The outsiders. And he says, go to the outsiders and fill up my house. Go to the highways and the byways and all of those country lanes and make them come in. Isn't that interesting? Make them, compel them, drag them to church and drag them into the kingdom. So there were fences along the highways where beggars would rest and sometimes look for protection. Most of the Bible scholars, when they look at this story, believe that this is in reference to the Gentiles. So I'm kind of happy today as an outsider that I've been invited in to the banquet. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Amen. Jesus has invited us to an amazing banquet. The task to go to the outsiders of the outcasts of the city was fulfilled in the parable, was, was part of me fulfilled in the parable, but the parable ends with the task of still bringing, it doesn't tell us that the, it's full. It just kind of ends because it's still got lots of room. Amen. There's lots of room for people to come to this, this banqueting hall that the Lord has. We're left hanging. And that's because today is a day of gathering the outsiders. Hallelujah. That's why this church is here. <laughs> that's why you're here. We were gathered. Someone prayed for us. Someone shared the gospel with us. Maybe we were born into a Christian home and our parents shared with us that Jesus loves us. We're all outsiders. And our job is to say to other outsiders, come on. There's room around the table for you. And so they go to the highways and the byways. Unfortunately, Jesus says none of those that were invited are going to taste of it. And when he started off in verse 12, he started off by using the word you. And it was in the singular. He was answering the, the one person. It was the host. He was saying, when you invite people, you should invite all kinds of people. And now he uses the plural form when he says... None of you that have been invited are going to be able to have a part. It's a sad thing. I believe God is, still loves the Jewish people and they're going to turn their hearts to Jesus someday in the future. They're gonna, it's going to dawn on them. Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. He is the one. That will be wonderful. Wonderful time. Sometimes the guest is unavoidably absent. In this case, they were unavoidably absent. So now Jesus addresses the audience. And he says, those in the house were in danger of excluding themselves for the banquet of salvation that Jesus was offering was his banquet. What are some lessons that we could learn from this particular parable today at TPC? Well, the Messiah's banquet promised by Isaiah is the banquet referred to in this parable. Secondly, the parable is left open-ended. The house isn't full. We still have a task to perform. We have work to do. We have people to pray into the kingdom. Neighbors to share the gospel with. Number three, the excuses offered to refuse to respond to the invitation and to join them in the banquet are stupid and insulting. Pardon me if you don't like the word stupid, but that's the best word I could come up with. <laughs> Fourthly, the original guests have their counterpart in every generation. The invitation is extended to the unworthy ones who can never compensate the host. They're not in the same league as the host. They can never compensate them. And number six lesson, grace is unbelievable. Special pleading is required for many of the undeserving to be convinced that the invitation is genuine. You know that? You ever meet somebody that just doesn't think they could forgive themselves or God would never forgive them? Hallelujah. Jesus paid it all. He loves. Grace is not, we cannot earn salvation. Just a few more lessons. 
It's warning to the believing community not to be presumptuous. He will proceed. He will fill the house with outsiders. He will fill. Another lesson is time is running out on the invitation. Jesus is coming soon. And I believe right now around this world, as things are more chaotic than I've ever seen in my lifetime, and the world's in turmoil, I believe that this is all part of a stirring, and Jesus is preparing his church so that they will begin to seek him, and we'll have great events happening all over the place that will just need an explanation. We'll say it's the Holy Spirit. It's God that's doing this. It's the Holy Spirit doing all these things. Who's coming to dinner? Guess who's inviting to dinner? Our response at Tim Timmons Pentecostal Church to those that the Spirit is inviting to the banquet is that we want to keep on top of whatever's the latest. In Bracebridge, where I helped out just before this, we had a couple of ladies on the board and they were also on the school board and uh, they were listening all the time. And as soon as COVID restrictions were to lighten up a little bit, Phil was down at the church measuring, putting more room in, doing everything we can in, to make sure that there's room for people to come to our church. And, and this uh, Friday afternoon, just about quitting time for Joanna, just about quitting time, and the phone rang, and I listened to her conversation because the doors were open between the offices. And I heard her explaining there wasn't any room this morning for them. My heart was so sad. As I listened to the conversation, I discovered, I don't know who they were, but she helped them. She was wonderful the way she dealt with them and said, can I, can you come if, if on Sunday morning there's space, how soon can you get here? She did everything she could. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to make sure that every possible space where we can, we can fit people in, is going to be fit in, amen, <laughs> because we want to see that's the harvest that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is moving in Timmins. I just know it when I'm praying. I have this anticipation in my heart. I have it in my anticipation for this church that great harvest days are ahead. I don't have a description of that. I have a vision, but I just have a sense and that he's bringing in people. And not only is he bringing in the lost, he's bringing back some people that one time were serving the Lord. And, and so we just are here as a board and pastor and we're going to do everything we can to keep on top of it because the call is going to let's bring, let's fill this place. Amen. Amen. Oh God, just remove this COVID thing so that we can have people jammed in here shoulder to shoulder and be safe and all that. That's what we're looking for. Amen. Amen. We don't want anybody. And so my heart was broken and uh, she told them how to get in next week. And uh, so... Oh, for the day when we can jam as many people in here as possible. There was a preacher who used to look down at the pews and there would be a few empty pews and they were all wooden back in those days. They weren't as comfortable as yours are. And he said, uh, we just want to do one thing. We want to get the wood family out of this church. <laughs> he always made sure there wasn't anybody there. His last name was Wood. <laughs> well, we want to do whatever we can. And as we pray, God is in the process of doing something in Timmins. Yeah. I just know He is. I just know He is. Yeah. I'm not just a motivational speaker today. I don't say that because that's going to encourage you to whatever. I just feel it. I just, I just feel in my heart. God is drawing people. He's drawing first-timers, red and yellow, black and white, bruised, lost, hurting, wandering, wondering. TPC is a lighthouse. TPC is a place of safety. TPC is a place of healing, a place of refuge, a place where friends are, where fra a place where love can be found and love can be experienced, where the presence of God can be felt. Amen? That's what God has in this church. And I'm excited with anticipation about what God is going to do next. And I know I'm going to be here. I am here for the first part of it. And so we're all invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I hope everybody here today has received the invitation and accepted it and received Jesus Christ as their Savior. Have you accepted? 
Jesus as your Savior, are you saved today? Amen. Amen. If you aren't, then why don't you see me or one of the board members after the service and say, you know, I'm just not right with God, but I want to be right with God and we'll pray with you and you can receive Jesus as your Savior. Worship team, why don't you come and we're just going to sing a song here. I think it's called The Waymaker. That sounds like a good song, doesn't it? The Waymaker. Jesus is a Waymaker. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.